الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد باب في الاستيق في آداب الاستيقاظ من النوم باب في آداب الاستيقاظ من النوم فإذا فرغت من الاستنجاء فلا تترك السواك فإنه مطهرة للفم ومرضاة للرب ومسخطة للشيطان Actually, we're beginning today, inshallah, from the chapter on the ta'at which we read the introduction to yesterday and today we continue from the chapter on waking up from sleep and Imam Ghazali is going to take us step by step from when a person wakes up he says فَإِذَا اسْتَيْقَظْتَ مِنَ النَّوْمِ فَاجْتَهِدْ أَن تَسْتَيْقِذَ قَبْلَ تُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ وَلْيَكُنْ أَوَّلَ مَا يَجْرِي عَلَى قَلْبِكَ وَلِسَانِكَ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فَقُلْ عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ he says in waking from sleep, make an effort to be awake before daybreak. Now, in Islam, daybreak, or the day actually, is considered to begin from fajr and not from sunrise. The actual day or the date as such begins from maghrib, but the day as opposed to night begins at fajr time. It begins at fajr time, and it goes until sunset, and that's why... When in fasting they say that you can make an intention in the Hanafi school, for example, you can make an intention to keep a fast by the half day mark. That half a day refers to the time between Fajr and sunset and not between sunrise and sunset. So sunrise, that's a time when people should not even be sleeping. Uh, there are some ahadith to that, uh, to that effect. And the barakah begins after the fajr time in the morning time to get things accomplished. What Imam Ghazali is saying here that just as when a person is born, they say la ilaha illallah, the first thing that, actually they don't say la ilaha illallah, but the first thing that goes into their ears is la ilaha illallah, is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is uh, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, similar to when a person dies as well, that the last thing that a person wants on their lips is La ilaha illallah as well. So we come into this world with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the adhan is read in our ears and called in our ears and adhan and iqama are called in our ears and then when we die. Likewise, since, death, uh, since sleeping is a minor form of death, it's also encouraged there that when we get up, we come back with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, when we go to sleep, we go with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just in case we are to not wake up again, we would have gone on the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll explain that when we're going back to sleep. But right now we're just waking up. He had to begin somewhere. He started with waking up from, from sleep. Although when people will be reading this, they're going to do many other things before they actually go. They're probably going to go to sleep before they actually wake up. So uh, the, the only reason he chose it this way was just to begin a logical point in the, in the morning. So he says, when you wake up from sleep, فَجْتَهِدْ أَن تَسْتَيْقِذَ قَبْلَ تُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ Then try, make an effort to wake before daybreak, which is before fajr. So uh, that's tahajjud time. Uh, you get a, you know the last moments of tahajjud there. Let the first activity of heart and tongue be the mention of Allah Most High. So this is even before you go and use the bathroom or wash your face or whatever. As soon as you get up, this is the thing that should be. Uh, this is the thing that a person should get up on. I was actually just speaking to <clears throat> one of my teachers about a project that we're doing regarding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and poetry, and he's uh, he's mashallah very. Uh, he's, he's he's a very very. A uh, pious person, mashallah. They actually call him Sufi Sab. I mean, he, his uh, name is uh, Mufti Tahir. Malna Tahir, Mufti Tahir is in England. But they call him Sufi Sab. And he, he just told me the other day, he goes, for some reason, in these last few weeks or whatever, whenever I'm waking up, I feel like I'm either hearing the uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being praised, or I'm saying... Salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Myself, I feel like I'm saying it when I wake up And he says, I guess I asked him, I go, how does that happen? So, uh, he didn't tell me much there But He just he just mentioned that to me 
فإذا استيقظت من النوم فاجتهد أن تستيقظ قبل طلوع الفجر وليكن أول ما يجري على قلبك ولسانك ذكر الله تعالى Praise be to, uh, then he says, فَقُلْ عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ So these are some of the du'as that he mentions. Now one thing to remember here is that these du'as are not necessarily all from directly from the ahadith. Many of these could be related from other pious uh, predecessors. And uh, some of these Imam Ghazali may have made up, Allah knows best. But there's nothing wrong in saying them as long as you understand that this is not necessarily from the hadith. Things only become a bid'ah when you do them as part of the deen and think that they're part of the deen. Now, just using a dua that somebody else made up, there's absolutely no problem in doing that because you're just using the finely constructed words of you know somebody else if you like them. I mean, if you think that they're worthwhile, if you think that they are useful, then you're going to use them. So it's not really about uh, it's not really about anything anything else, right? So uh, uh, try to uh, try to understand that. Let's look at some of these. Some of these are you'll recognize. Alhamdulillah, الذي أحيانا بعدما أماتنا وإليه النشور. This is very popular. أصبحنا وأصبح الملك لله والعظمة والسلطان لله والعزة والقدرة لله. So first, you're praising Allah subhanahu wa taala when you get, get up by saying that He is the one who gave us life after after death. And to him is is the return and the gathering. We wake, we awake, and the entire universe awakes in a state that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala holds the key to everything. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala holds the glory. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has all the might. So immediately you're praising Allah, showing Him His greatness, and you're declaring His His Majesty from the beginning. So you're saying that praise be to Allah who has made us alive after making us death. To Him. Are we raised up again? In the disposition of surrender to Allah, have we come to this day? And in the word of sincerity, actually, that's a that, that's a different du'a. There's different versions of this book in which there's different du'as, a few different du'as mentioned. But basically, let me just read a few of them and then I'll translate. In this one, I already translate: Asbahna wa asbah al mulku lillah, wal azma tu wa sultan lillah, wal izza tu wal kudra lillah. أصبحنا على فطرة الإسلام وعلى كلمة الإخلاص وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا مسلما وما كان من المشركين أصبحنا على فطرة الإسلام In the disposition of surrender to Islam to God Islam have we come up to this day أصبحنا على فطرة الإسلام وعلى كلمة الإخلاص and in the word of sincerity وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم in the religion of our prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and على وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا مسلما وما كان من المشركين and in the community of our father Abraham a monotheist a Hanif this Hanif and مسلما this word Hanif what it means what Hanif and مسلما means is Hanif means to come away from all other types of deities, all other types of objects of worship, and remain purely for the for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, completely khalis for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And that's what Ibrahim Ali Salam did, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentions in the Quran, where he was first he looked at the sun, he looked at the moon, he looked at the different things of that nature, and then eventually he said that my Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala can only be the the one great one who never disappears, and it says he was Hanifam Muslima. So we make this declaration in the beginning. So aside from making this declaration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the most majestic, etc. Then we go and we declare our faith again. So we are reaffirming our faith in the morning. Then we say, Allahumma bika asbahna, wa bika amsayna, wa bika nahya, wa bika namut, wa ilayka nushur. That, oh Allah, through you do we come to this day and through you do we come to the night. Uh, we enter into the night through you. And through you do we live. And through you do we die. And then we are raised up again to you. Allahumma inna nas'aluka an tab'athana fi hadha al-yawm ila kulli khayrin. Wa na'udhu bika an najtaliha fihi su'an. Aw najurrahu ila muslimin. Aw yajurrahu ahadun ilayna. We beseech you for the good of this day. So, O oh Allah, may you bring us up on this day 
to bring us upon this day to do all the good of the day. And we seek your refuge that we perpetrate any evil in there. So we, we seek your refuge that we perpetrate any evil or that we are we we take uh, or that we convey any evil to any muslim or anybody comes to us with any kind of evil or pulls any evil towards us yeah i'm doing this translation myself because this book doesn't necessarily have um this portion translated or does the translation actually very generally نسألك خير هذا اليوم خير ما فيها ونعوذ بك من شره وشر ما فيها and we beseech you for the good of this day and of what is in it we take refuge with you from the evil of this day and of what is in it so now we're seeking protection from the coming day and then he says فإذا لبست ثيابك فانوي به امتثال أمر الله تعالى في ستر عورتك واحذر أن يكون قصدك من لباسك مراء so even when now wearing our clothes for the day, we make this special intention, which is that when you wear your clothes, when you put on your clothes, make the intention of fulfilling the commands of Allah about covering your nakedness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to take libas. Make that your intention and do not let your purpose in wearing clothes be to display before people so that you go astray. In this one that we have, it doesn't mention going astray in this in, in this Arabic edition. But uh, basically the idea is that you don't wear clothes to think, oh, I'm going to, you know, uh, look better than anybody else or people are going to see my great clothing or whatever. The idea, the main idea should be that we cover our nakedness. And then obviously, if we, we want to seem a bit more presentable, then there's absolutely no problem in having... Uh, nice clothing as long as it doesn't lead to humiliating anybody else or degrading anybody else or looking down upon any, anybody else or just this kind of uh, sense of vanity, conceitedness uh, or conceit and so that that's basically the issue the next part is Babun Adabu Dukhul Al Khala chapter on or chapter on the etiquettes of entering uh, the toilet or as they say in America the bathroom or another word is the lavatory. فَإِذَا قَصَدْتَ بَيْتَ الْمَاءِ لِقَضَاءِ الْحَاجَةِ This is normally understood to be the thing that we do when we get up in the morning. So that's why he mentions this here. فَإِذَا قَصَدْتَ بَيْتَ الْمَاءِ لِقَضَاءِ الْحَاجَةِ فَقَدِّمْ فِي الدُّخُولِ رِجْلَكَ الْيُسْرَى وَفِي الْخُرُوجِ رِجْلَكَ الْيُمْنَى وَلَا تَسْتَصْحِبْ شَيْئًا عَلَيْهِ إِسْمُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَإِسْمُ رَسُولِهِ وَلَا تَدْخُلْ حَاسِرَ الرَّأْسِ now, it says when you enter, when you want to enter into the Baytul Ma, the house of water, which is basically the lavatory, al Haja to relieve yourself. Now they, they call this different things in different countries, different Arab countries. In some places they call it the Mirhad, in some places they just call it the Hammam, you know, probably following the American idea of the bathroom. And in some places they, they call it Dauratul Miyah, the place where the water kind of is generated or goes around. But this seems like an older word that they probably used in uh, the Persian area, the Iraq, Iran area. فَإِذَا قَصَدْتَ بَيْتَ الْمَاءِ الْحَاجَةِ So when, when you go to the lavatory to relieve yourself, enter with the left foot first and come out with the right foot first. The, the, the symbolic uh, reason for this is when you go into the Bayt al-Khala, it's supposed to be an unclean, impure kind of place. So you go in with your left foot because you do those kind of things with your left side or with your left hand left foot. And likewise, when you come out, because you're coming into a relatively cleaner place, supposedly, you, you will come uh, with your right foot. وَلَا تَسْتَصْحِبْ شَيْءٍ عَلَيْهِ إِسْمُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Don't go into the bathroom with anything. Don't take along with you anything that contains the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or of His Messenger. Now, whether it's covered or not, the best thing is not to take anything at all. However, the ulama have given permission that if something is covered and cannot be seen, it's not observable, like it's inside, it's inside, then that would be, that would be permissible. But if there's a possibility of you leaving it outside, that's the best option. Then he says, وَلَا تَدْخُلْ حَاسِرَ الرَّأْسِ Do not enter into it with your head uncovered. 
This applies obviously both to men and women. And this is based on a, there is a hadith, I believe I saw the other day about this, which is in Bayhaqi. It might be da'if, I'm not absolutely sure. I can get a chance to check it out. But there, it's mentioned, Imam Ghazali mentions it here. Leaving it open has has been mentioned by some scholars to uh, to create different forms of uh, problems like uh, uh, like uh, forgetfulness and so on. I'm not absolutely sure where they where they uh, have mentioned that from, but uh, it's important to understand that this is something that you see in books. It's actually mentioned from before from many different scholars, and it's I believe it's based on that hadith which is in Sunan uh, in Bayhaqi. And Bayhaqi relates that hadith. وَقُلْ عِنْدَ الدُّخُولِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ عَوْضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الرِّجْسِ النَّجِسِ الْخَبِيثِ الْمُخْبِثِ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ As you enter, say, I take refuge. I, uh, I take refuge with Allah from filth and defilement. Again, the translation is a bit different from here. But I'll just translate it that I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I begin in the name of Allah, Bismillah. That's why in one of the hadith he actually mentions that the veil between a person and shaitan is actually Bismillah. So when a person enters, he should say Bismillah so that the shaitan is not able to see the person or see the aura of the person, which is the, the part that needs to be covered. So you say Bismillah and then I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any type of filth. And al khabith al mukhbith I guess that can be translated as defilement, and the shaitan al rajim and the shaitan, who is the rejected one. Wa in al khuruji ghufranak, and when coming out of the bathroom, then a person should read ghufranak. Ghufranak is, I seek your protection, I seek your forgiveness. I'm sorry, I seek your forgiveness. Why does this is mentioned in the hadith as well. Alhamdulillah, ladhi adhab anni ma yudhini wa abqa alayya ma yanfa'uni. This first part, ghufranak, is a very popular dua. The reason for saying istighfar when coming out of the bathroom, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to say ghufranak, alhamdulillah, ladhi adhab anni al-adha wa afani. The reason is that there's many reasons that ulama have given that ghufranak means shukranak, which means thanksgiving to you, praise be to you, or thanks to you because you've Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed from us the impurities from our body. Likewise, another reason that the ulama give, which relates to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that he was always in the habit of making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout his day. And when he was in the bathroom where the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be taken, upon coming out he would seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having had to not be able to remember him in that way that he normally remembered him in in while in the toilet or while in that state so th- these are some of the reasons that have been given and praise be to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has removed from me that which harms me and he's r- left with me that which benefits me وينبغي ان تعد النبل قبل قضاء الحاجه والا تستنجي بالماء في موطء قضاء الحاجه وان تستبرئ من البول بالتنحنه والنتر ثلاثا وبامرار اليد على اسفل القضيب then you must he says you must make ready the material for cleaning before leaving yourself so to get your water and your your tissue paper whatever else that you need get that all together and then do not what, uh, here he says do not make istinja with water istinja means okay there's two words here one is called istibra one is called istinja istinja is the cleansing after relieving oneself the word istibra means to make sure that you are completely uh, you, you don't have any drops left and you've made sure that you've completely emptied yourself or cleared yourself and there's ways he's going to mention uh, to do that but Istinja means to clean yourself afterwards. So he's saying that don't do istinja using water in the same place that you removed, uh, you you defecated or urinated. I think the reason he says that is maybe in those days they had, you know, the kind of makeshift places uh, that that were not necessarily built with flushes and you know with this whole system where you can flush everything down. So it's to make sure that the filth doesn't get on you. So kind of move aside to another cleaner area. Uh, obviously, in our case, our bathrooms or toilets are made in a kind of a more uh, m- more formal way where all of these things are taken into consideration so that there's, there's going to be nothing wrong with that. And then, وَأَنْ تَسْتَبْرِئَ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ بِالتَّنَحْنُهِ وَالنَّتْرِ Try to 
do istibra, which is to try to relieve yourself completely by two things, by tanahnu and by natr. That means uh, maybe uh, swallow a few times to try to get things out, cough a few times, and also try to, uh, he says, when you pass urinate, you must press it out and sprinkle it three times, placing the left hand under the member. That's, that's for men. He's mentioning here the different ways of relieving yourself to the last drop because you don't want to get up, put your clothes on, and then after that you find that there's some drops in there. And some scholars used to be very particular about this. In fact, it's related about some scholars that they would actually have a completely separate set of clothing to just use it, uh, use to go into the bathroom with. When they would come out, they would change that after obviously having washed themselves and relieving themselves properly, and then they would put on their other clothing to go and pray with. So. Uh, you know, we unfortunately may not have the time uh, and the resources to do that all the time when you're at work or school or whatever. But the idea here is to make sure that it is done as best as possible so that nothing remains. And uh, try not to do it in a hurry. Try to have some time that y- you make sure that you wash yourself clearly and properly. وَإِن كُنْتَ فِي الصَّحْرَاءِ فَبْعُدْ عَنْ عَيُّنِ النَّاظِرِينَ وَاسْتَطِرْ بِشَيْءٍ إِنْ وَجَدْتَ وَلَا تَكْشِفْ عَوْرَتَكَ قَبْلَ الْإِنْتِهَاءِ إِلَى مَوْضِئِ الْجُلُوسِ وَلَا تَسْتَقْبِلِ الشَّمْسَ وَلَا الْقَمَرَ وَلَا تَسْتَدْبِرْهُمَا وَلَا تَسْتَقْبِلِ الْقِبْلَةَ وَلَا تَسْتَدْبِرْهَا وَلَا تَجْلِسْ فِي مُتَحَدَّثِ النَّاسِ أَوْ فِي ظِلِّهِمْ ولا تبل في الماء الراكد ولا تحت الشجرة المثمرة ولا في الجحر so these are all of the other adab regarding using the bathroom, he says, if you are in the desert, or if you're in an empty space where there's no cubicle to, you know, for privacy, go away from the eyes of the observers, and keep behind some object if there is one. You know, we may never have to do that, but sometimes if you're camping, you may have to do that, or sometimes if you go to another country. I remember one person traveling in Pakistan, they stopped at some service, so-called service station on the way, and he said, where's the bathroom? So they showed him a bunch of these little jugs, these water jugs, water containers, uh, these lotas as they call them. And uh, he said, where's the bathroom? He goes, take one of these and go out into the field and find you know, yourself a place. So he said, I went and uh, nearly, missed my, uh, nearly missed my bus. So a lot of us, I mean, be, you know, not used to this kind of stuff, but uh, it's good to know about it. When, if you're ever exposed to that. Then he says, do not expose yourself before you reach the place where you are to sit. So be very careful about that. Do not face in the direction of prayer. Don't face, don't neither face towards uh, the Qibla and neither y- your back should be towards the Qibla. Do not pass water in a place where people meet, nor in still water, nor under a tree with fruit, nor in a cave. Because all of these places are where people may go and benefit and sit down, you know, like uh, trees where there's um, uh, uh, fruit trees, the fruit may fall on the ground. To uh, f- fruits may fall on the ground. So things of that nature. Likewise, in a cave, somebody might want to rest in there. Uh, avoid hard ground and the windward direction, so that you are not splashed. For the Prophet sallallahu said, "All the punishment of the grave is from it." So if you're ever in this situation, try to find a way to do it where it's not like that. In sitting, rest upon your left foot. And do not urinate standing, save in case of necessity. Inshallah, we'll have to carry that on tomorrow because our time is up. Our time is up. And we'll leave the rest of the time for questions if there are any. Can you repeat the reason behind covering the head? I heard was silence. All I heard was silence after that. The reason for covering the head, one is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The second reason that they give here in this edition, the editor, he gives this reason. He says that one thing is, leaving it uncovered, it creates a fear of the jinn. It incites a fear of the jinn. It also uh, engenders forgetfulness. And it's also part of keeping yourself such that, so that when you go into the bathroom, you're more covered up. So whatever is in there, does not, you know, you're covered up in there, so that you're 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 not in kind of direct contact with that place. So it's about, it's more about covering up in in a place of filth. I think that's another reason that they give here, and then. 
he mentions that it's actually a sunnah, and I think that's based on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So I think it's it's a sunnah. So if you can, you try to do that. And obviously, if you're in a place, you know, it's not such that you actually, if you don't have a hat on, that you should put your hat on to, and and then you stop at a service station that, you you know, you'll have to put your hat on. You can, I mean, to to do that. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that it's not like absolutely necessary, but it's good to do because because of this uh, mention. And likewise, a person should not go into the bathroom without slippers. You know, sometimes in some places they just have a carpeted area where they actually go into the bathroom without slippers. That's not a good idea because normally you might expect there to be some filth in that place. And coming, you, you, if you don't have slippers, and you'll be, you may tread on it. There may be, there may be splashes sometimes. Sometimes it's kids that come. You know, it, it just depends. There could be uh, impurity, and you could be bringing that out. So it's best to dedicate a pair of slippers to the bathroom so that that's the only place that you wear them and they don't come out so that that's a that's a very good idea so that's then he mentioned that there's some also some other uh, medical benefits to it, it says uh, you don't when you cover your head in the bathroom it's not going to let your your hair will not you won't by mistake leave some hair in in the bathroom because wherever we go sometimes uh, some of our hair may may drop you don't want that to be in the bathroom because the hair just like uh, other parts of the body that you clip like the nails or whatever you actually told to bury them if possible now obviously some of us who live in apartments who can't find the place to bury we're not going to be able to do that but uh, the, the, the worst thing actually to do is to flush them down the toilet because parts of your body are mixing up with the filth of your body and that, that's not necessarily recommended so one of the other benefits of uh, covering the hair would be that it will stop uh, your hair or you know make it less likely for your hair to to drop there uh, that's another benefit that we see and then they've mentioned a few other points here is it a proper adab to cover your head at home? For women, I mean, it's a it's a good adab to you know keep the hair covered whenever possible. It's not necessary, but it's a good idea to keep it covered when possible, uh, but not necessary. What are the reasons the ulama gave for leaving the hair covered in the bathroom? I just explained that. I wasn't able to hear the kind of problem we can have if we don't cover our heads when we enter the bathroom. It looks like this is a very popular topic. I, again, I've explained that. If you still have questions, let me know. Can you repeat the part about covering the hair? What is what if you're in an open desert and nothing to block your view to use the restroom? Then you just go as far as possible. Because the first chapter of uh, Sunan Abu Dawud, for for those who've studied it, they it's actually that babun uh, when a person chapter on when a person goes to relieve himself, then he should abada. He should go as far as possible. He should go as distant as possible so that where there's nothing, where there's no nothing to hide behind or to conceal oneself behind, then the distance is what matters, and that's the best you can do. Can you repeat from sleeping rules till waking up rules? Uh, just the, the the waking up rules is that you fir- the first thing that you sh- should try to do is to take the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First thing you should do. And mashallah, there was a, a local brother, he is actually a convert. A very nice, very nice brother. He, he just had a heart attack recently. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us all. But he had a heart attack recently. And while he was, while they, had, while they were operating on him, and while they'd made him, Unconscious, while he was falling into that unconscious state, the, all the, uh, the 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 nurses who were attending to him, they said, "We heard you saying something in Arabic," and mashallah, he he was he was doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and that's a very good sign for your for yourself, your body to take over, for your mind to take over, even when you are not intending to do dhikr for your mind to do it. That's a very good sign because inshallah that's a good sign that you should get it at your death as well in la ilaha illallah. That's why it's, uh, it says regarding for example Sheikh Zakaria as well that he was so used to saying Allah all the time that even when he was uh, in this unconscious state or sleeping or whatever you could sometimes just hear you know Allahu 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 or that kind of a sound coming coming from him. So the only way a person can do that is if they become uh, if they accustom themselves to dhik- doing dhikr all the time. I was told it makes you lose your memory, scientific reason. That's possible. That, that, that's another reason that he's given here, nisyan, that forgetfulness, which is uh, basically a loss of memory in that sense. If there is no visible najas in the washroom, can one recite dhikrs during wudu? You know, the washroom, if it's a very large place where you've got a toilet on one end and on the other side, you've got a, you've got the 
wash basin, the, the, the sink, then it would be okay as long as, you know, it's a kind of a considered to be a separate area. But if it's like right next to each other, then I would be more careful. I would, uh, you know, try to find another place. And that's unfortunate. You know, you should try to make another place. Uh, if there's a door in between, then there's absolutely no problem. If it's another room, there's no problem. Is throwing away hair bad adab? Is that considered having it? Uh, is that considered having it buried? Now, buried is the best way to do it. Buried, but sometimes we just cannot do that. So uh, then, you know, your next option is to just throw it, wrap it up, and then and then throw it. Is it true that the angels of mercy won't enter if the woman's hair is uncovered? Thus, it's best for her to cover her hair at home. I am not absolutely sure about that. I've heard that a few times just from people and I know that they say this in certain you know, families and homes or whatever, but I'm not absolutely sure about that. I don't think so because really, I mean, it's not part of the aura of the woman as long as she's not exposing it in front of people that she's not supposed to expose it to. But I'll try to look into it and see if there's any basis for that. Is it true that you don't cover your hair that the angels leave the room? Again, that was a similar question. I was told that if you close the top of the toilet, then you can say vikrs. Um, you see, the idea is not just the toilet, although that is one point, that's a good point, but if you're still in that within that area, there may be, you know, stuff may have fallen, I mean, you could clean it up, I guess, and then it would be considered very clean and pure, but it's just still not a good adab to say it in that state, just be a bit this way onto the other side, try to be a, a slight distance away, that, that would be the best thing to do. Do we have to cover our hair in front of mahrams like father, brother, and mother, and brother, as I do cover my face, i.e. parda, in front of non-mahrams? You, you, you don't have to uh, cover your face, in, uh, sorry, your hair in front of your mahrams, but it's still a good idea to do that. Just because it's permissible not to, it doesn't mean that you completely open up either. Uh, for example, in certain cultures, uh, uh, in certain cultures, just to give you an ex a quick example, when a woman is nursing her baby, in many cultures like uh, I, I know the Indian culture and the, uh, the Pakistani culture, they, they will still try to cover up even at that time, even though they, they're just in front of women. Right? If they're, in front of, uh, if they're in front of women, even then they'll still try to cover up. They won't just expose themselves. But in certain countries, uh, my wife noticed that um, just because it's permissible, you'll see that they'll be very casual about it and they'll just completely open up. So the idea is that the part that needs to be covered doesn't mean that uh, the, the idea that, that the part that does not need to be covered doesn't mean that it has to be exposed. Imam uh, Hassan, uh, uh, um, uh, Sayyidina Hassan, radiallahu anh, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu one of his statements is for a mahram person that do not even look at the hair of your own mahram women. So don't look at the hair of your mother, your sister, your aunt, Aunt, if uh, you know if you can help it because that's all part of you know attraction of women at the end of the day and he doesn't want you to even go close but it's permissible it's permissible for a woman to expose her in front of a mahram it's just better not to if, if she can help it and uh, is the toilet is right by the sink can we recite the duas in our mind yes you can recite the duas in your mind you can think about it in your mind but uh, you can't utter them you can't make a statement uh, you can't articulate them through your tongue is it allowed to shake hands with mahrams other than father and brother or all people grandfather grandfather types it's permiss um, it's permissible to shake hands with a mahram as long as there's no fitna possibility as long as you don't think there can be any fitna if there is somebody who's not that close and you know who you know, you don't know, uh, but they are mahram. It's better not to shake hands, but uh, it's permi there is a permi again, there's a permission here, but it's not necessarily that it has to be taken uh, unless you know you need to take it, or if you don't foresee any problem at all. If the toilet is right by the sink, can we make wudu, or do we have to make wudu in the kitchen? You can make wudu there uh, because you expect the place to be kind of clean. It's makru to make wudu in an impure place so that you know you don't want to get soiled again. But it's better if it's if it's somewhere else. That, that's that's the point. Um, thanks, but no thanks. What is that? If we simply throw our hair away, won't it be buried in the junkyard? It depends. I mean, sometimes they recycle this stuff. Sometimes they bury it. They do different things to it. Plus, uh, th that's a possibility. They may they may. They may do that, they may bury it. It just depends. It's just, we are told to do it ourselves. Plus, the best thing is to bury it yourself because if you put it into the into the trash or into the dustbin as such, it might uh, they might do different things with it. Plus, it's going to mix with a lot of other stuff. 
it's going to mix with a lot of other filth that has come through, all the other junk that has come through. So it just depends on you know how you feel about that. Uh, you know, the, the the point is that you can definitely put it into the uh, you know buried, burying it is the best thing to do. Is there any dua that we can pray before throwing away our hair and nails to ensure no harm comes to us through them? No, I think the dua that we should generally do is just our protection duas to ourselves, which is, you know, like Bismillah ladhi la yadurru ma asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis samai wa huwa sami'un alim a'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tamati min sharri ma khalaq the last qul huwa Allahu ahad qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas you know, the mu'awadhatayn surah al-fatiha these are general duas that you should do all the time because we don't know where harm can come to us from right, whether it's through our hair or whoever it is it doesn't really matter it's not to become paranoid about our hair the point is that we should make this dua all the time so that you know we, we remain protected all the time I was told that if Najas is flushed away in the bathroom then that room isn't considered as a place of Najas so one can say the wudu dua is allowed you know that some scholars may say that that's absolutely fine if they say that because I can understand the logic that if you completely clean the bathroom and it's completely washed and sanitized and then all the floor and everything is mopped properly and everything it's not necessarily dirty but the thing is that that's the place that is normally used to relieve oneself so it's not just about the filth being there it's also about the place where you normally relieve yourself where there may be you know some kind of najas around because a person does not necessarily mop up and you know do uh, completely sanitize the the toilet and you know bring out the 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 sanitize uh, the, the disinfectants and so on and you know clean up every time they, they have a bath or they sorry every time that they have uh, they they relieve themselves so it's important to understand that there's not just the reason of there being filth there but also the reason that that's a place where normally filth is or that's where a person normally relieves themselves so there's reasons for that that's why if you can be slightly away if there's a sink which is uh, maybe you know a few feet away in that place it'll be a better idea as opposed to right by the toilet so when you do enter into the toilet the dua that you read for the toilet should actually be said outside if possible or in the area that's not by the toilet otherwise just say it in your mind